Kelly, the next video um, in our internship or our, our Peach Printer 1 series, joint by joint potion. Okay, and as we talked about in um, our joint by joint presentation, the body is built um, with joints that are both mobile and stable. Okay, every joint needs mobility and stability, but certain joints are going to be built for more mobility and more stability. And, and sort of what, what the purpose of our coaching is, and what I'm always trying to do, is watch the client move and ask myself, you know, are the major load bearing joints doing what they need to do? For example, uh, you know, if somebody's doing a squat and their knees are coming together, obviously that's going to be the point that I'm going to coach them through, you know, and that's going to be, you know, the area in which I, I kind of keep my eyes on. You know, there could be a lot of up, a lot of other things going wrong, but as a coach, you have to be able to kind of quickly spot, you know, the area of breakdown, um, and then understand that the right cues for, you know, for the right person. You know, somebody, some. Some people are kinesthetic learners, meaning um, they're going to respond better to touch, whereas other people are going to respond better to giving them certain internal or external cues. So really having a good sort of um, overall understanding of this is going to make you a better coach and um, help to simplify the process of getting results with our clients a lot. So uh, when we talk about coaching, um, the majority of the clients that we're going to work with in our general population um, is go are going to be beginners. Okay, and the way that I define a beginner is somebody that has less than three months of structured training, right? Now, this could be somebody that's worked out at the gym for many years, has done Billy Michaels videos, kind of just comes in and does whatever they want. We consider this a beginner because they've never had any consistency or coaching. So somebody could have been exercising for many, many years and move poorly. And this is kind of what we see more and more in our population is sedentary. You know, doesn't, doesn't necessarily place value on uh, moving and kind of understanding bodily mechanics. So our job as coaches is to kind of hammer home the basics in the beginning and just teach them to move efficiently through, you know, whatever they're doing. And, you know, as, as a person becomes more experienced and, you know, proper form, we can load them and expand the range of their, their movements, you know, and things of this nature. But typically a beginner is going to lack basic bodily control, and they're going to require coaching. And, you know, this is the reason that we exist as personal trainers and as coaches. So our goal with this is just to hammer home basic exercise selection and basic fundamentals. So when I'm assessing clients and I'm meeting them for the first time, one of the things that I'm always wondering is, you know, what is the way that they work best? Okay, do they, are they somebody that I have to kind of push into position? Meaning, you know, for somebody that um, drops their hips in a push-up, you know, do I, do I adjust them physically, you know, and then they get the idea, okay, this is right, what right feels like. Um, are they a verbal learner in which I say, okay, um, right now you're staying in your hips, and what I want you to do then is uh, back flat like a table. Maybe that cleans it up and, you know, light bulb goes on for them. Or maybe I just, you know, put them in a mirror and I show them what they're doing versus um, what I feel is right. You know, any of those um, could potentially work uh, just depending on how the person learns best. And I'll, I'll be making notes of this. The other thing is, you know, as I'm, as I'm talking to the person, as I'm, you know, assessing them for the first time, you know, do they, do they learn quickly? Um, if I show them the movement, can they throw it back to me? Or do they not, you know, have that movement accurate? Um, you know, and I'm writing all these things down. So, so I know, okay, these are my notes on this person. Um, typically, I'll keep notes in my personal training client centered session, but even in my small group as well. And then as well, you know, what is their personality? Do they prefer to work out alone or can they self study? In which, you know, it would be better maybe show them some, what they're doing in a mirror or, you know, possibly what I'm doing. Or are they better in groups when I'm coaching, you know, three people at the same time? They're watching their partner and that kind of thing. So, really, all of those play into um, how we're going to get best results with this person and, you know, how they're, we're going to get best feedback back. You know, when, when we talk about the joint by joint approach, um, what I'm always trying to do is, again, look at, look at the segment that's, that's failing. You know, where does the person break down? Um, what are the person's weak links? You know, what do I have to, what do I really have to be mindful of? Because if I, you know, if I'm coaching a push up, for example, um, and let's say, you know, the person has, um, you know, neck pain. Uh, I, could, I could look at five things that they have wrong. You know, maybe their elbows are squaring out. You know, their, their back is arching as they do a push-up, and their head is coming forward, you know, amongst other things. You know, I know that because they have neck pain, um, the most important thing to begin with is the position of their head. So I'm going to make that cue first, and I'm going to try to just stick to that cue. Um, one of the big mistakes I've made in the past that I find that, you know, a lot of beginning coaches make is they try to do, too much too soon. They try to say, keep your head back, you know, shoulders back, elbows in, back flat. I mean, by the time you get into three, four cues, the person
person is so confused that it's like they're paralyzed. And I've seen that, you know, it's it's almost like uh, information overload, especially with beginners that are new to front end. Uh, people that are a little bit more experienced can do a little bit more with that. But instead, um, maybe just adjust them physically and say, okay, try to maintain this position. Something like that that's outside of the scope um, to allow them to, you know, kind of get the best result without overwhelming their mind um, and just having them execute with overthinking things. We talk about the joint by joint again. You know, we have our mobile and our stable joints. Um, typically, I'm watching the stable joints to see whether they're moving or not. So, for example, with uh, you know with the knees, we want the knees to maintain um, structural alignment over you know a neutral position, subtalar neutral over the hips and over the feet. You know, do they cave in or do they go into a step two terrace or valgus? Um, with the feet, same thing. Do they do they excessively pronate or do they put some weight shift into one side? You know, as they're stepping, as they're squatting, as they're lunging. Um, you know, the pelvis is it is it rotating as the person moves or is it able to you know, stay over the feet. And then, you know, you could go up the body and you could look at each and every other joint to see whether or not they're moving. This is what I've always seen. So, uh, does an area move and then should it move? So, you know, does it need duct tape or does it need WD-40? You know, and for me, the first thing that I'm going to do, especially when I'm coaching, is just try to cue the person out of it. Okay, if they, if they um, you know, if they're coming into knee valgus and I say, okay, push your knees out, don't, your, your knees are caving in, don't let that happen, um, and they get better, and that's just a, you know, that's just a motor control thing. They've never been told to do that before. So now I've given, I've given them conscious awareness of what they're dealing with. And typically, with a lot of people, you know, especially those that have neck pain, back pain, shoulder pain, um, they move poorly. So they just have, you know, unconscious ignorance of what they're doing. If you make them aware of these, of these things, um, then, you know, it might be more awkward for them in the beginning. But this is now they're, you know, now they understand kind of, this is my area of breakdown, so this is what I need to focus on. We can't be everything to everybody. We can't focus on everything. So this is kind of what I'm looking at, and this is what I'm focusing on. And then if all else fails, you know, I can I can use foam rolling, and I can use you know corrective exercise to help along in that process. Let's talk about good coaching. And for me, good coaching is understanding the client's best style of learning um, and what they're going to need individually. Okay, anytime. Um, going back to the whole discussion on whether the person is uh, verbal, a kinesthetic, or a uh, visual learner, um, I think they're everything. You know, I'm assuming that the person has, uh, you know, is, you know, is going to learn best when I provide them each of those things. So typically, when I'm introducing a new drill or or whatever, I'm going to show them the movements. I want them to show it back to me in the mirror. Um, I'm going to give them some sort of a cue, okay, based upon what I see, and then if necessary, I'm going to push them into the right position, meaning I'm going to have them hold even isometrically in whatever we're doing, and I'll physically turn them into the right position and, and kind of demonstrate this is what right feels like. You know, in the beginning, a lot of clients that, again, have, don't move well are going to be like, well, I'm used to, you know, moving this way and it doesn't feel right at all. But right for them and right for us is going to be different. So we have to show them and demonstrate in other ways. So in a lot of cases, um, you know, the, the kinesthetic part of kind of pushing them into position going to be very important. Um, so for us, in the beginning, we're going to use a lot of things, a lot of tools to help to teach movement, okay? And that's going to be things like um, isometrics, where I'm just having the client, where we're just having the client hold in split squat positions, in squat positions, in push-up positions. And we're just working on their fundamental mechanics until, you know, they can kind of feel what right looks like. Then we'll move into just very slow tempo-based movements, meaning, you know, we're going at a slow controlled pace, we're not moving them, you know, at all fast, just to learn the movement in a controlled environment, and then as the person's confidence improves, then we can speed up, but again, it's a very layered process, as we'll talk about. So, if I'm looking at, um, if I'm formalizing this process, and again, I don't expect you to write down, like, the person is level one, two, or three, uh, if I'm looking at level one, level one for me is form or technique, okay? Either I'm having the person hold an isometric, and I'm, I'm just adjusting them, okay, or I'm having them perform the movement at what I call a tempo pace, where it's basic, three seconds up, three seconds down, the person is controlling the movement, moving slowly, um, so I can watch them, so we eliminate momentum, and we can really watch them move, and they can gain some good control. This is uh, a tempo-based phase, is something that we'll, we'll start with new clients, so um, we do this, and we're going to start
start body weight almost in every case. You know, and this is uh, the basic push-up, split squat, throwing. Um, just at, at this slow pace so they can get good control. Um, they're building, you know, they're building good motor patterns as they do this. And then, you know, we're going to load them from anywhere from 5 to 20 reps. And we're loading typically in the first eight weeks. Um, we're just working on control. Okay, they're going to get stronger as a result of neuromuscular adaptions. But the person in the first eight weeks, you know, having never really done stuff like this, is going to be a sponge um, to, you know, retain new information. So I'm trying to take advantage of that and really get some neuromuscular gains as far as getting just good control of these movements. And then I can load them after that. I'm not so worried about uh, the person getting super strong in this phase. I'm just worried about them getting control. If they can show me, you know, 50 to 20 really good controlled reps, then I will add some load, you know, and, and I'll go very gradually. But that's not the point in this phase. So once the person is pretty confident in the movement, you can see that they can move fluidly through the movement. Then we're going to really start to add some external load um, and move into what we call our progressive resistance phase. Okay, and progressive resistance, this is just where we're, we add five pounds of bar. Okay, and this is one of those things that you can exploit with a um, or utilize uh, with a new personal training plan or new person that you know hasn't done this stuff before for years. I mean, up to two years I've seen this work, and all all we're basically doing is just adding weight to the bar. You don't you don't need to um, periodize the program. You don't need to change reps and stuff really, you just need to say, okay, uh, typically we're going to go for higher reps because we're seeing the person's not necessarily ready to uh, develop maximal tension, so we just say, you know, 8 to 10 reps, uh, we'll increase the pace, 1 up, 3 down, so up fast, down slow, um, and you, you know, we can either increase the difficulty via loading um, through, you know, the push up, we move them down, we increase the angle, um, so the body's bearing more weight, or if we're dealing with, like, let's say a squat, you know, we can hand them load, we can change the in different ways, but again, we're just anytime they can do three sets of let's say ten of an exercise, we just make it harder in some way and we write it down. Simple as that. So our level three, our hardest progression, you know, that, that we're going to do in our gym would be maximal loading. Okay, and this is where the person is lifting maximal, you know, amounts of weight, heavier weight, and that kind of thing. And with this, again, we are we are improving, we are increasing external loading. And this is going to be more for our intermediate clients that have been with us for a while. Um, and it's kind of a misnomer because we, we classify clients as beginner, intermediate, beginner, and intermediate. Um, I don't have any advanced clients. So, you know, the only time I've ever seen advanced clients is when I go to like powerlifting gyms, you know, and I see guys that are lifting six, seven hundred pounds. I mean, they are truly advanced in terms of um, strength training because they've been doing it for a long time and they've been loading these patterns. So uh, whereas if you take like, let's say, a soccer player, right, uh, a professional soccer player, I've worked with a couple, they're not going to be anywhere near that, okay, they're not, they're not going to be advanced, because we're talking about strength training specifically, um, so unless the person's sport is weightlifting, um, very rarely do we see an advanced person, and what that means in practicality is that very rarely um, are we going to need to really apply very advanced periodization, like, for us, linear periodization, meaning periods of hypertrophy, periods of, of volume followed by periods of more relative intensity um, is about as advanced as we get. And for the most part, moving between these two things, again, once we sort of max out this progressive resistance idea and the person starts to plateau, is where we're going to move to. And this is where we get the maximum loading. Okay, and this is anywhere from one to six reps. Um, this is going to be harder because it requires you, it requires the client to develop maximal tension. Um, and again, this is one of those things that we're not going to we're not going to get into this probably in the first year um, with a lot of our, our beginner clients, but you know for the more advanced clients, you know we will do this fairly fairly regularly. Um, very very rarely though am I doing anything below three reps with um, my general population clients. If I'm dealing with a strength athlete like a football player or something like that, then yes, I'll load the max in this. But it just really depends on who we're dealing with. Some of the basic workout templates are the same thing. Um, in our sessions, yes, we include power work. Yes, we include conditioning. So there's some things that you don't see here, but this is our basic template, all right? We have, um, we, you know, we create movements, not muscles, all right? So we say um, we're doing a total body workout, which is typically what the majority of our clients are going to be on. Upper body push, lower body push, um, something like a push-up. Um, uh, so it's labeled a TRX row, but that would actually be something like a squat or a D dominant exercise. Um, and then we insert some sort of a corrective. Upper body pull, um, lower body pull, which would be like an inverted row and a deadlift, and then 
again, you can insert another corrective exercise. So you can see here that uh, three sets of five, pretty popular rep range with a lot of people. Um, but again, you know, from young to beginner, maybe I start with five reps in week one, eight reps in week two, 12 reps in week three. We just want to build up. Um, don't increase the weight per se, but we just increase the reps. And so we're getting more quality reps um, at a certain weight, you know, and then we increase, you know, as the person gets closer to week three. So this should be as you're coaching with exercises. For all of our clients, we're going to start with a foundation phase. So we take them through these basic foundation exercises to make sure that they have a good foundation of movement. All right. So again, our philosophy, we train movements, not muscles. And certainly we train all of our muscles. But, you know, I'm concerned with, you know, can this person push? Can they pull? Can they do it with their arms overhead? Can they do it with their arms, you know, uh, horizontally, you know, and then can they limp with their hips? And can they level shift? Okay. So for us, horizontal push, you know, we're going to touch push up. And one of the big things to consider is with these, these are a combination of body weight and uh, external resistance exercises. But the cueing in a push up is going to be the same for a dumbbell press. It's going to be the same for a bench press. Any other horizontal push that follows is kind of begins with a push up. So that's why we chose this. Horizontal pull, okay, so a row. All right, typically we'll do TRX rows to begin with, but this could be a dumbbell row, it could be a band row, just depending on who we're dealing with. Vertical push, we have overhead pressing. Okay, typically we're going to start with dumbbells because uh, they allow the, sh the they allow the shoulders to breathe a little bit better. But again, you'll see that we have a progression with these that begin with actually carrying weight overhead. Vertical pulling, um, we move from incline TRX rows to chin ups. Single leg knee dominant split squats. Um, those are our precursors to single leg squatting as well as different lunge progressions. Um, double leg knee dominant, which would be squatting. Okay, one of the most fundamental things we're going to do. Single leg knee dominant or hip dominant would be single leg deadlifting, and then double leg hip dominant would be deadlifting or hinging. Um, all vital skills and all kind of the the base of the tree from which um, you know our exercises build. All right. So when we when we talk about these these different exercises, I'm not going to get too far into um, coaching with any of these because we're going to you know, do a lot of exercise selection and coaching and that kind of thing in our workshops. But you'll notice that I've just broken this down into different areas. And so I'm just thinking about when I'm coaching a client, like with a push up, for example, um, you know, the core, the shoulders, the head. Typically, these are the these are the major areas um, where we see breakdown or we see faulty movement. So you, you just watch the client do the movement. Say, okay, where is the uh, where is the breakdown? You know, what do we what do we want to do? And if, if it's not something that is coachable at that time, you know, what is the regression? You know, if I if I'm if I'm giving somebody a cue, for example, to okay, keep your back flat, and they're still not showing me that, even though they have awareness of it, I know that it's probably a strength training. So then I'm going to um, regress the exercise, and we'll see what that looks like in a second. Um, but you'll you'll notice as well, um, you know, I have kinesthetic and verbal cueing. You know, kinesthetic, um, I can place my hand into their stomach or if they're force sagging. I could use a band around their stomach to kind of give them ideas. Um, and then verbal cueing, I'd say, okay, um, keep your back flat like a table. Or if I use an internal cue, uh, drop your ribs down. The difference between internal and external cues is that internal would be me saying, like, get your head up, um, shoulders back, chest up, something like that that involves something within the client's own body. All right. Whereas an external cue um, would be something like uh, back flat like a table. Okay. External would be, or, or even better, um, you know, push your back up to the ceiling. You know, so with that, I'm not thinking so much about um, what I, my body needs to do. I'm just thinking about doing it. You know, there, there has been some research to state that external cues are a little bit more um, effective than internal cues because we're not allowing, the, we're not getting the person to think too much about it. And it kind of, it kind of goes back to the idea of like a flow state. In a flow state, um, I just execute whatever I'm doing, you know, for better or worse, I just get it done. And um, you know, typically, what happens happens, and tip, you know, I, I don't, I don't overthink things. Usually, with coaching as well, it's like when I, when I overthink things, I'm, you know, I'm being internal. I'm, I'm thinking inside of myself. I'm overanalyzing. You know, and as a result, maybe I don't get the I, I second guess myself too much and I don't execute in the right fashion. So external cueing definitely has a lot of value. When we talk about external cues, we'll workshop some of these um, when we go through our our our, um, our demonstrations and whatnot. But just think about 
what are some good external cues for an internal cue you're going to push up? I mean, an internal cue would be elbow to 45 degrees, um, push to press, or, you know, uh, shoulders back, chest up, whereas external cues would be like, um, push the floor away from you, okay, or, you know, bend the barbell, things like that, you know, things where you give them the task and just, they just execute. One of the most important concepts when you talk about with coaching is the idea of progressions and regressions. We might have three clients who are doing the same exercise but have strength and needs at different levels. So we're always going to include with our workouts several progressions that are written in. Um, and, you know, my progressions might be a little bit different than your progressions, but uh, for purposes of this video, you can see that for the push-up, uh, you know, we have, we have uh, some push-ups performed on the bench, push-ups performed on the box, floor, and then seat elevated. So, again, in levels of difficulty here. Um, but we could also do other things like include um, isometric pauses. You know, we could certainly do isometrics in various positions. Um, with a push up, I also like to do eccentrics. So starting the push up position, lowering them down. Um, you know, it's for five seconds, we're at one, two, three, four, five. You know, we count our clients down. And again, just watching them move and seeing, you know, it, it, if, if three people have the same exercise, two people might need. You know, a push-up hold on the floor, and one person might be, be doing a push-up with their feet up on a box. You know, that's kind of up to you to look at, and that'll really help to, you know, simplify the job of your cue. So if we're going through an entire workout, you know, typically we're going to have two to three progressions written in. And as you can see with these different exercises here, we have, you know, level one, level two, level three. Uh, and our progressions are going to change slightly for the different groups that we work with, but the idea is just to be right in progressions. And we're always going to have these, you know, in this way, um, you know, for your client, you know, if I, if I have to train them that week, I know where they are, you know, and I know what they can do, and I know how I can, you know, progress them or not, um, and this is just going to make our job easier. So this is how I always want you to be thinking, and this also gives us, you know, the value of exercise. Um, the reason I don't feel that squatting on a BOSU ball is of value is because there's nowhere that we can go from there, okay? We can't really make it heavier. Um, we can't really increase the complexity because the person will end up falling off. Um, not to say that there's not some benefit to it, but where do we go from there is my question. So that might be like a level five thing where we can't go anywhere else. But even when I get to the end of a lot of these, you know, with a, with a split squat, um, you know, I, I can do an overhead split squat. I can still add load to that. I can still elevate the back foot. I mean, there are, you know, there are different things that I can do to manipulate it to make it harder. And that's kind of the point is, you know, how do we continue to make it harder? Um, you know, and how can we, how can we continue to uh, create some difficulty here? When we're talking about core coaching. This is super important because we're always going to start our sessions typically with core training. Um, and we talk when we talk about a strong core. Um, what we consider to be strong is not what you know, is going to be achieved through things like sit-ups and crunches and leg lifts and that kind of thing. And this is, you know, the prevailing opinion on core training. So for us, it's teaching the client to break, teaching the client to breathe. And the trainer has to be a strong pillar um, to actually resist the motion and to act to stiffen the spine. So what we're going to do um, when we're coaching core training is the first thing is just cueing the client to breathe. Having them put their feet up on a wall, okay? Um, put their hands inside of their ribs, just breathe in, and just get the idea of filling their ribs and filling their belly with air um, like a cylinder. Okay, and then from there, then we can teach them forced breathing where they take a deep breath in, they blow out while tightening their abs. And we tell them, okay, so this is the best type of core training you can do because when you're blowing out, you're literally making your weight um, not smaller, but you're, you know, you're tightening things up because one of the functions of our deep core muscles is, is abdominal compression. And then we're going to take these into isometric stabilization uh, exercises, such as planks, dead bugs, side planks, that sort of thing. But with any, any core exercises that we're going to perform, we want to find neutral. Okay, and again, neutral is sort of a heated topic. What is neutral? How do we do it, et cetera? But in reality, if you're kind of finding the middle um, between flexion and extension, we have somebody with a Extension-based back pain, we're going to err more towards flexion. If we have someone with flexion-based back pain, we might extend a little bit more. But the idea is to get into the, the least stressful position possible um, and then train our core to resist the motion of the extremities around it. 
Okay, and so we talk about our foundation core program. We introduce it to you, which is going to be plank. Si I'm sorry, dead bug, side plank, um, bird dog, and then plank as well. You know, we'll talk about how we can progress these things, but that's a, that's an important takeaway. So just a question to ask um, when we're when we're thinking about exercise, just generally as we go along. Number one, um, how can I choose which exercise is most effective? So um, how does this person learn? You know, what it, what is the style with which they learn? What are some cues that I can use for this person that are going to help them be effective? Whether it be moving them into place, whether it be um, cueing them into a certain position. Um, is the next one would be, is this plant ready to load and press exercise? All right. So with that, um, going back to the whole joint by joint idea, can the joint get in position to load? Okay. So is there some sort of a mobility restriction? Um, if there's not, can the person move competently enough? Load that joint without a danger. Okay, um, and if they can't, then you know we're going to be backtracking the body weight. Um, so based upon that, how can I progress and regress an exercise based upon the client's need? Um, and then how can I vary an exercise based upon the client's need? And with that, um, let's say we have push-ups programmed in, the client's getting bored. There's a million different types of push-ups you can do. So instead of just having them do the standard, you know, push-up on the floor, or whatever, you could have them do shoulder tap push-ups next week. You could have them do two push-ups next week. You could have them do staggered push-ups next week. So we're getting a lot of variety and autonomy um, out of the same exercise. We're varying the pattern. We're keeping it interesting. And we're feeding their body a little bit of different stimulus. All right, so our conclusion kind of based upon this presentation is, number one, be brilliant at the basics. All right, if you watch me coach, I probably have seven or eight exercises that I use and I just vary. Um, you're never going to replace a lunge. You're never going to replace a squat. You're never going to replace a push-up. Those things are the fundamentals and they should always be in somebody's program. I truly believe that. Um, all exercises begin with basic cues, okay? And I'm always considering, you know, what are the cues? I have my go-to, but then what are the cues that are going to fit best with this person? Um, body weight and technique before increasing distance, all right? They say, Kanye West said, don't crawl before you ball, okay? Or, I, I'm sorry, you need to crawl before you ball. And that's probably the only time that I'm going to quote Kanye West. But he was right in a sense, all right? We always start with body weight and technique. Uh, before we'll make it harder. So don't jump to step Z before you hit step A. Variations upon a theme versus changing pattern. We just talked about that. And then figure out, you know, what is the combination of visual, verbal, verbal and kinesthetic cueing that your client's going to need